for all the little boys and girls who look like me watching tonight. <laughs> this is a beacon of hope and possibilities. This is proof that dreams dream big and dreams do come true. When I was about 10 years old, the, uh, while uh, they were teaching me the Bill of Rights and freedom of the press, the FBI came to visit my father. The reason why they came to question him is that his name was on a Chinese newspaper. And I would say to my father, but I'm American. My father said, look at yourself in the mirror. You are not American. He said, you have to learn Chinese. If the U.S. should ever get into a conflict with China, you will have to go back to China. Look what happened to the Japanese. And that opened my eyes to the fact that when they talked about me, they talked about that Chinese girl. Okay, so let me jump right into the questions, actually, um, Henry and Joyce. Let me thank you also both first for being here this evening. I appreciate you taking the time out of your day uh, for this very important issue. Our pleasure. It's a privilege and an honor to be here with you, Phil. So, Henry, let me start with you, because you've spent a lifetime as an activist in the Chinese community. I'm just curious, what got you motivated in the first place? That's a, a very old story. When I was about 10 years old, the, uh, while uh, they were teaching me the Bill of Rights and freedom of the press in elementary school, the FBI came to visit my father. And um, we were 10, 11. Our family was very young at the time, my brother and myself and my mother. And um, the reason why they came to question him is that his name was on a Chinese newspaper subscription list. Um, that perturbed me because as a young boy, I was wondering, what is this that they're teaching me? And what am I seeing on this one incident? And it was the only time it ever happened. Hmm. But it totally disabled and um, confused uh, our family life for part of the next 10 years. Not knowing what our future or posterity might be like. And so it just stuck with me. That, um, and then looking around and talking to my father about it, that you know, where he could turn to for help, there was no one to help. This is, by the way, we're talking about the um, mid-50s. So there was no Chinese organization. No one knew anything. There were other, of course, this was right in the middle of the McCarthy era. And so there were in newspapers, there were other stories about other people who were being pilloried. In fact, some people even, especially people who were living in the bachelor society, committed suicide when similar things like that happened because they had no way of finding out and there was no, no, no agency or anything like that. So after a, it stuck with me a while, but as, a few years after I graduated college, I was, I've always been a member of the New York City Chinese uh, American community. People at the Chinese American Planning Council asked me to uh, climb on board, and I did. And so that lasted almost 20 years from the early 70s to 1990, at which point, um, 1989 was the formation of the Committee 100, and um, Committee 100 was also looking for someone to, uh, well, I was together with a few people, Ian Pei and Yoya Wang, a few other people like that. We helped found it, but then the organization needed someone to help at least uh, steer it at the its embryonic stages. And Joyce, I have a similar question for you. I, I, how did you find your legs in um, this landscape of Asian American history, Chinese American history? I'm the fourth generation uh, of my family in the United States. And I have to say it that way. I can't say that I am a fourth generation Chinese American. My great grandfather, my grandfather, and even my father was barred from becoming a US citizen by the laws that existed at the time. And so by birth, I am a US citizen. My children and grandchildren 
are fifth and sixth generation Chinese Americans. And throughout my life, I have heard the stories about the kinds of experiences my great grandfather had, my grandfather had, and of course, my father himself. By virtue of their exclusion from being able to become US citizens and to be able to take full participation in the US, I began to understand that I was not considered American. I remember having arguments with my dad and where he said to me, you have to speak Chinese. And I would say to my father, but I'm American. My father said, look at yourself in the mirror. You are not American. He said, you have to learn Chinese. If the US should ever get into a conflict with China, you will have to go back to China. Look what happened to the Japanese. And that opened my eyes to the fact that when they talked about me, they talked about that Chinese girl. They didn't see me as American. And that really heightened my awareness of my identity. So that is amazing. I think many people don't realize how difficult or even impossible it's been for intergenerationally Asian Americans to become, well, Asians to become Americans, I guess that's best said. That's really fascinating and sad at the same time, but perhaps we're moving towards a hopeful moment. Let me ask you guys to discuss, well, here's the thing. Recently, acts of violence against the Asian American community have been going on, but they're not unprecedented, right? They, in fact, are part of the deeper history that you're just discussing right now. So let me ask you to talk about immigration from the beginning and what the obstacles, not just for your family, but in the context of racism, like in the society that we're in on the everyday, can you get us through some of the, the history of it? What was it like, the laws? Um, more or less continue what you were saying, but expand beyond your family experience. Yes. Um, you know, the history of violence and scapegoating of Asian Americans primarily beginning with the Chinese is a long a series of events from legislation to the way that laws were applied and so on. Let me just uh, start with, for example, the transcontinental railroad. I think everybody knows the story about how it is essentially the Chinese laborers that built the railroad to connect the West Coast with the East Coast. And nobody talks about the achievement of those people. No one talks about the fact that it is the work that was done by the Chinese laborers that enabled Leland Stanford to become the extremely wealthy man that he became and to build Stanford University. As a matter of fact, that is a legacy that was enabled by the Chinese workers. But after the railroad was built and completed in the late uh, part of uh, 1869, there began to be a great deal of resentment towards Chinese laborers. You know, by the way, nobody knows the stories about the Chinese laborers continuing to build railroads throughout the country and connecting the West Coast to other parts of the West Coast and so on. But because of deteriorating economic uh, conditions in the United States, because people could not find work, etc. It became very easy to target the Chinese and to say that they were the ones that were bringing down the wages and so forth. Um, and they essentially used the Chinese as an excuse, and you're going to see this throughout history, where they scapegoat the Chinese and other Asians because of their own mismanagement of the economy and, and things of that nature. You know, um, just quickly fast forwarding, for example, to the death of Vincent Chin, you may or may not know the history of that. There was a young man who was out in, in the evening uh, before his wedding, uh, and he was attacked and killed by American auto workers because they thought he was Japanese. The auto workers were upset because they said the Japanese were taking away American auto worker jobs. Well, that's not the case. Again, it was easy to scapegoat the Asian because we look different. The fact of the matter is American management, the American industrial leaders failed 
to make American cars competitive. That's really what happened there. Yeah. And if you look at all of the rhetoric today about the Chinese, for example, taking jobs away from Americans, no, I'm sorry, they could not come here and take our jobs away, to take our American jobs away. It is our American leadership that took the jobs to China. So because of the economic conditions that arose once the railroad was built, for example, there was a depression in 1873, there were a lot of people, again, unemployed, living in very difficult economic conditions. And the leadership, the politicians sought to talk about this and to look at potential remedies to make the population more satisfied. So they came upon the issue of the Chinese being people that brought down wages, they were different, and it became very easy to scapegoat them. In 1882, the Chinese Exclusion Act was passed. That act limited immigration of Chinese into the country. As a matter of fact, uh, when I was a teenager, they were still only allowing 105 Chinese into the country until the laws changed in 1965. Uh, from 1882 forward until 1946, the Chinese who were born overseas could not become naturalized citizens. As a matter of fact, in the late 1800s, if you were born in the United States and of Chinese descent, you were also not allowed to become a U.S. citizen by birth. And it is because of litigation brought by the Chinese community all the way to the Supreme Court that the rule was established that if you are born in the United States, you are a U.S. citizen. And as a matter of fact, you saw uh, former President Trump try to roll that back. He talked about anchor babies. He talked about um, limiting the number of people who become citizens because they were born here and so on. So this continues. So that gets us right about up to, Henry, why don't you take over and talk about a little bit more contemporary uh, point of view? I mentioned this one small personal incident in the middle of the 50s uh, with myself and my family, but all this quickly segues into the 60s and the 70s when in conjunction with what Joyce is talking about, mistaken identi identification and in high influx of Asian imports all the way from toys to electronic to automobile. And the reason for that, and probably a topic for another discussion has to do with basic economics. Uh, labor rates were much cheaper and for a very, very fundamental reason because of the mass of humanity that is in Asia. I mean, between India and China and much of Southeast Asia, we're talking about 3 billion people. And so it's not very difficult to get into an excess labor situation, which is, would be a repeat of what happened in 1882. Or if you think about it, in 1882, that's just a date that they created the Immigration Act, the Chinese Exclusion Act in 1882. It probably took 10 or 15 or 20 years of discrimination activity and protests and everything else from 1862 to 1872 to 1882 to get it done. So subsequent to 1882, it wasn't game over. There is um, much litigation and much, many laws uh, throughout the West, all the way from Southern California up to Montana, with nuisance laws that basically, for instance, forbade Chinese stores and operations to stay open beyond six o'clock, to forbade um, white employees to work with Chinese uh, owners and all sorts of things like that. Uh, going into the uh, mid-century, mid-50s and 60s, we had a immigration change situation where there was an influx uh, because of the change of immigration laws from the previous 105 um, uh, quota to the thousands. And that led into a huge number of people from Asia into the United States, into the hundreds of thousands during the, that, that decade. And probably at, by the end of the decade, a million or more. So with this immigration change led to a further, uh, basically, labor supply. And American public began to see it personified. 
During the 40s and 50s, there were fewer than 100,000 Chinese in the United States. No, now there's like 6 million or something like that, uh, and about 15 million Asians. What accounts for the upsurge in immigration? The change in the law. Are there any circumstances happening in China that make uh, immigration now, the, suddenly The popular better? belief is that uh, going back to 1840, which is a topic for another discussion, as a result of, you might say, the opium war and the ineptitude of uh, the, the, the imperial people, um, the Chinese economy began to dive, sharply dive, uh, as I've mentioned before. In, 19, in 1840, China had 35% of the whole world's GDP. By the time 1949, when Chairman Mao took over, the global share was 1%. In 100 years, it went from 35 percent to 1 percent. But by almost 19 unbelievable, really. Yes. So you can imagine what the country was like. I mean, everybody has seen the, the poor photographs of the poverty in China in the 1920s and 1930s and all that sort of thing. But the immigration over here was was not high because of the immigration, the, the strict immigration laws. But when 1965 opened up the floodgates, <clears throat> many people came here for education. Most of those people were my classmates. And uh, I have a lot of personal experience and personal exchange with them. They um, naturally, in the beginning, you might say the best and the brightest, along with the people who were looking for, for um, working class people who were looking for a better economic life came flooding into this country. So you began to see that. And what that created was what I call Chinese underemployment. Uh, with a huge excess, there weren't that many uh, job openings as there are now, for instance. Now, for a Chinese or a Chinese American uh, or any other Asian American, you could enter almost any field. Back in the 60s, we were still in the very, very um, common phrase. I'm sure Joyce's family probably told him, so did mine. You know, we are, if, if anything goes wrong with your life or your career, you're destined to go back to running a restaurant or a laundry. And I personally had experience with some of my coworkers when I was a, a waiter in a Chinese restaurant in high school, witnessing and experiencing people who had basically PhD and master's degrees who were forced to be waiters and cooks in a Chinese restaurant. So underemployment was, was there also. With this huge immigration yeah. uh, influx, Chinese Americans and Asian Americans began to uh, bump up <clears throat> into other careers. And that led into something called the bamboo ceiling which is also endemic to some of the problems we're talking about. We're Actually, talking about. I'm about to ask that question, so that's perfect timing. First, can you explain for the audience that isn't familiar, what is the bamboo ceiling? About 20, over 20 years ago, President uh, Bush, number 41, appointed me to the Federal Glass Ceiling Commission for about six or seven years that I served. I spent a fair amount of time in Washington listening to a lot of testimony of people who had these problems. I was the only Asian member of the 20 member commission. And you heard many, many instances where people would get masters and PhD degrees or even law degrees, but similar to the glass ceiling phenomenon that we had in this country, and we still do, um, especially with a, on, on a gender basis, but on an Asian basis, we call it the bamboo ceiling because in addition to being very well qualified and resulting in underemployment. I mean, worst case I heard uh, as a commissioner was a man who had two PhDs working at a, an aircraft factory as a, a, as a designer. And um, because his English was not all that good, he was assigned to go to a remedial English class uh, by his supervisor who he implied was basically um, not favorably disposed towards Asians or minorities. Mm -hmm. And that marked him in his career throughout the company because when he went to remedial English class, he was there with basically janitors and other service personnel from the kitchen and all that other sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So you have very extreme cases like this, but you don't need to have an extreme case like that to be a victim of the bamboo ceiling. You just need to perform and study well and work hard. One of the large accounting firms there uh, and this is this experience is only less than 10 years old their first year associate entering employees 
numbers 45% Asian. That includes South Asians as well as East Asians. How many partners are Asian? Fast forward 25 years later, and they've had this experience documented, the partner level only has 9% Asians. Mm. So in effect, what happens is 36% of the Asians who didn't stick around to be partners forfeited their opportunities because they had to go find better opportunities elsewhere. Of course, the numbers of partners is a lot less than the number of early entrants, but why weren't there 45% partners who were Asian, both South Asian and, and East Asian? It's a fair question. And I think it's a good opportunity really to pivot. So it's very important for Asian Americans to understand the accomplishments of Asian Americans, but it's also very important for the wider American public to understand the incredible value uh, that Asian American communities have brought to our culture. And so I feel like that's, it's a challenge and it has to do with education. So I wonder, Joyce, if you wouldn't mind speaking to some of the upcoming changes or the hopeful changes that um, are attempting to be addressed within the education system, both um, at, the, at the higher level, you know, at the university level and also K through 12. I do believe that there is a real need for all of us to have a better understanding of where people have been throughout history in this country. I think it's pretty clear that many of us have walked in the same shoes along the path to becoming Americans. You know, I often think about the fact that people don't know anything about the Japanese internment uh, during World War II, where after the bombing of Pearl Harbor, the Japanese Americans, two thirds of whom were US citizens, were rounded up and put into internment camps out in the hot desert. As a matter of fact, the NAACP had documented the fact that these areas were dirty, uh, people died from the heat, babies and the elderly and so on. But here we have a situation where the young men whose families were interned, whose mothers, fathers, brothers, sisters, children were imprisoned, fought for this country. There's a very famous military story about the 442nd Battalion. And you may remember Daniel Inouye, who was the Senator who played a major role during the Watergate hearings. Um, Daniel Inouye was a Senator from Hawaii. This, particular battalion has the highest number of decorations of a battalion of its size in the entire history of the United States. As a matter of fact, if you go back and you look at the, the research on this, they earned 9,486 Purple Hearts, 21 Medals of Honor, and an unprecedented seven presidential unit citations. And yet, Again, their parents and family members were in prison during this time. Mm -hmm. They helped to turn the war in Europe in particular. There are stories about them, uh, this battalion freeing uh, people from the concentration camps. They went in, they witnessed the horror, but they were told to step aside so that the white American commanders could stand there holding the gate, taking credit for this. This is the kind of thing that happened. These were people who were rounded up, forced to sell their property. Within four to two weeks, they lost everything because of this. And yet our major enemies were the Germans, the Italians as well, and they did not suffer similar consequences in those kinds of numbers. And again, it is because of the fact that Asians are very easy to spot. It's very easy to make us others. And I think if people learned about the substantial civil rights contributions that the Asian American community made through the litigation that they brought, fighting uh, the discrimination and the disparate uh, application of laws that Henry Tang just spoke about, where, for example, a law would be applied differently to a Chinese business than it would be to a Caucasian-owned business. And it was primarily to make sure that the Asians could not compete. 
Um, they fought these, these incidences all the way to the Supreme Court, forcing this country to apply the 14th Amendment to everyone, making sure that we were treated the same way that everyone else was treated under the law. There are a number of major cases with respect to uh, desegregation of schools as well. Chinese, as people of color, were not permitted to attend schools with whites. Litigation, again, was brought there. So there are substantial contributions of the Asian communities in terms of civil rights outcomes, protecting all of us who are in this country, in addition to the fact that there has been tremendous contribution in the fields of medicine, agriculture, and so on. But how do we get this message out to the wider public? My question for you, because you are an educator, you are in that world. What is it that has to be done at the educational level to make a change to what you're talking about so that the wider public understands the value and contribution? I would challenge our education system to begin teaching the full history of this country, making sure that the history that is taught is inclusive. It is, it is horrible to come through school like I did and only learn that China was called the sick man of Asia, to only learn that we were decimated by the opium war and back to Western civilization. We never learned about the contributions that we made to this country. We did not learn that we were lynched the same way that other communities were lynched. Italian Americans have never learned that one of the largest lynchings in this country were of Italians and that Teddy Roosevelt said it was good when he heard that. If you know this history, if you know that John Kennedy's patriotism was questioned because he was Irish Catholic, if you know about these things, you would begin to understand where other people are coming from. Perhaps Black Lives Matter would have a different meaning to you had you known that your own people were treated as subhuman, as people that could be dragged out into the streets and lynched. Perhaps you would have a different perspective. And so I think it is imperative that the history that we teach from kindergarten on be inclusive and be accurate. Because again, we have all walked along that path to becoming American. And we do not know that we have crossed paths in, in that long journey. I think that's gonna be the last word, guys. I wanna thank you very much for joining me tonight, Joyce Moy, Henry Tang. Informative uh, to say the least. And uh, you guys are both incredibly generous. Appreciate very much.